I've gone from zero dollars to over eight and a half million in real estate assets over eight years. Real estate has changed my life. It has given me security, flexibility, and will always have endless possibilities. Anyone can join this game, but like any game, it has its challenges. I'm gonna give you my perspective into this world. I'm gonna set some expectations right now. This is not easy, not in the slightest, but it works. I'd say one of my biggest issues at the beginning was that I thought I'd be rich right away. I wish I had the following saying ingrained at the beginning of this journey. Move fast, but don't rush. Speaking of rush, that's my uncle's name. Shout out to Rush. All the cliche sayings that are out there are freaking true. Enjoy the journey and the destination will come faster. This business is one of high percentage success. What comes with that is that it is a slow moving snowball, especially at the beginning if you don't have a bunch of money in the vault. Speaking of vault, I was a pole vaulter for eight years right before I started in real estate. To say I had no experience would be a huge understatement. The term people used for me was green. For me, this encourages me to pull triggers. However, it also makes it harder to enjoy the moment. So find your balance. My point is, is that anyone can do what I've done. You're gonna make me ask for it again? Make me feel like I'm desperate? Where's the romance? Can it happen naturally? Can't you hit that like button without me asking? Hit it and don't quit it. Subscribe to me, baby. Give me the good stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Put some comments on my page. I don't want to share you with anyone, but I want you to share me with everyone. I want to convince you to do value add real estate. At the beginning, I did a combination of being a real estate agent and investor. One of the things I learned as an agent is that everyone who bought real estate early in their life made a ton of money. But those who added value to their real estate and consistently kept buying with the money they made became uber wealthy. Now let's stop beating around the bush. You have to have money to buy a property. Here are your options. If you already have it, fantastic. If not, borrow it from a relative or friend. Easier said than done. No question about that. Convince them to either lend it to you and you'll pay them interest or to invest their money in the deal and you'll get them a five to 10% return on their money and split the profits 50-50 or 40-60 or you get the idea, negotiate. I convinced my dad, a psychologist, to let me invest the 450,000 that he had built over 40 years. I took him to real estate boot camp classes. I walked him through the plan. I showed him my passion and ultimately he did me a solid. He was not the only one I was trying to convince. Almost everyone else gave me the cold shoulder to start. The next way to get the money to buy real estate is, you gotta get a job that can earn you cash and save for the down payment and other costs. It's a reality most have to face. But be creative in how you come up with the money. Be entrepreneurial, especially focused on your passions and how those could lead to building capital. Okay. Being at this part means you have raised or made the equity needed to buy a property. Now what? You gotta determine where you can buy, what the down payment will be, what the closing costs will be to you, the tenant buyout costs, and finally, what the holding costs and upgrade costs are gonna be. There's a tendency at the beginning to skip steps and underestimate the costs. Please, don't do this. I did. It sucks. That being said, if you're someone who gets analysis paralysis, this is just as dangerous as not being prepared. Remember, those who take risks are rewarded greatly. So let's say you have $500,000 total savings, which I know is quite high and can take some time to get to. You can do it for less, but for this example, you have 500 k If you're gonna do this full time, you need to set aside a year and a half worth of personal expenses. If you have a consistent cash flow source from a job, maybe just set aside four to six months as reserves for emergencies. 
So after you subtract this, you have 450,000 to play with. Now it's time to find a top notch mortgage broker that you trust. Take the time to vet out a bunch of mortgage brokers to see who you buy best with. They can make or break deals. I lost my first property because the mortgage broker couldn't get the loan he promised. And let's say for this example, the mortgage broker said that for a one to four unit property, I can get a loan of $500,000. That doesn't mean you're gonna buy a property for 950,000. It means that as you look at deals, you need to determine how much you're going to put into them for the upgrade costs, 10 buyouts, and holding costs. Most likely, I would try and find a property for 700,000. Put a down payment of 200,000, spend another 200,000 in upgrades, tenant buyouts and holding costs, and have 50,000 left over, just in case I underestimated some of the costs. And bam, you've got a property. Oh wait, hold on a second. You still have to find the right deal. That's one of the most important parts. That is one of the advantages I got by starting as a real estate agent. I was surrounded by listings and sales comparables. It was confusing to me at the beginning. Why were two different four units in the same area selling for vastly different prices? It took me about six months for it to hit me. Not only were there all these variations, such as building square footage, unit mix style, condition of the building, year built of the property, income variations, tons and tons of variations. But it hit me that some people just happen to underprice their properties because they don't compare and contrast very well. They miss the mark, and so do the agents. So if you become an expert in this comparable comps analysis, then from there, all you have to do is be patient and wait for someone to screw up. Re-listen to what I just said a few times. It's real magic. So get a non-agent membership to the MLS for the area you want to buy in and study for a few months and then pounce when you find one. It's all so simple, but it took me so long to figure out these simple but hidden gems. I'm going to do a future video on the nitty gritty details of a CAR purchase agreement so that you know it like the back of your hand. But for now, I just want to give you an overview of the main terms so you're prepared when you work with an agent. Hopefully, you've decided to let the listing agent represent you. But that means that agent is representing the seller as well. So you need to make sure the terms are right. First thing is price. This is an art. You learn from experience the right balance of what to offer so that you don't lose the deal. And at the same time, don't give more than you have to. If you know it's a great deal though, my suggestion is to lean more on the don't lose out on the deal route. Feel it out. After price, the most important thing is contingency periods. A contingency period is an amount of time that you have as the buyer to back out and not lose anything. There are different contingency periods. There is the inspection contingency and the loan contingency. There are more but these are the main important ones. I'm on the more aggressive side of these things. I usually go shorter inspection contingencies, sometimes none. The reason I do this is to get the deal. The seller and agent are more likely to accept your offer if the terms are good. For me, it's not as risky because I know what I'm looking for and what price is a good deal. And I usually gut the units for remodeling so it doesn't matter how bad they look. So long as the building isn't literally about to fall down, everything else can be fixed relatively easily. Every property is a little different, but the costs usually even out. Look at this deal I did near USC. This building was almost as bad as it gets, and it wasn't that much more money to fix it than other deals that don't look so bad. For loan contingency, I always have it as all cash just makes it more likely the seller will accept your offer. This I leave to you to decide if you're comfortable. It's potentially risky for sure, but it's made me a lot of money because the seller has accepted my offer over others. I have yet to not be able to close on a property because of the loan falling through. It can get tense at the end of the deal when you're waiting for the lender to approve the loan. 
proceed with some caution here. As far as the other terms, I always make sure I'm not trying to save pennies here. I just want the seller to be happy. To wrap up, pull the trigger. I think that is the most common issue out there. Most people wait too long and have a fear of jumping into the deep end. But like I said, the people who jump in are typically rewarded. Do some homework, then move forward and take action. Just go back and forth between those two things and I promise that you will be glad you did. Until next time, subscribe please below, leave me a comment of what you wanna hear more about, like this video, and I'll see you soon.